Oh, I guess that means it's time. Or at least nearly time. People are still filing in, so I'll just uh, mention the cause of this slide. Um, I have started since Caribbean DevConf um, last October, uh, where I did a whole talk um, where I originally wanted just to have nothing up at all on the screen. And the organizers said, we can't have nothing. Do you want your profile and picture up there? It's like, that's the worst thing that could possibly be up there. Why don't you just put be kind um, as sort of a theme for the talk? And I thought, do you know what? I want to have that before, at the start and end of every talk I do now, at least ones that I'm doing sort of on my own. Um, when I'm co-presenting, it's kind of more awkward to get it in there. Um, so I've got a, a different bit of white on every slide that I have like this. Uh, but I figure I could hopefully move the industry a bit in terms of uh, you know, understanding of C-sharp and understanding of versioning today and dates and times. But actually, if I can move people just a little bit to be a tiny bit kinder, and I'm sure you're all lovely people already, um, but if just being prompted makes you do one more act of kindness, then that possibly has more impact on the world than anything else I can do. Uh, so that's why I'm doing it. OK, uh, however, we're really talking about versioning today uh, because I'm still on a quest to find a topic that I can submit and still get accepted, but that no one shows up to. Um, I've tried dates and times. I thought most people would think those are pretty boring, but people still came. Uh, I've tried versioning, and, and you're all still here. Uh, this afternoon with Jennifer, we're trying feminism. You know, If I can't bore people away, maybe I can scare people away. Uh, but please do come. It'll be great. Um, but I seem to be drawn to topics that I find fascinating and many other people don't. So we're talking about versioning, or maybe we're talking about Hanabi, really. Uh, how many of you know Hanabi? A few? OK. Hanabi is a game of trust and communication. It's a collaborative game. Um, I'm not going to go into all the rules and things, but you're, you're trying to build something together, and you can see each other's pieces, but not your own and you can give tiny, tiny limited information, and you have to trust that everyone else is, uh, we're all working to the same goals. And the reason I mention this is I learnt Hanabi a few weeks ago at CodeMash, um, and it only struck me sort of 10 minutes before giving this presentation for the first time that Hanabi and versioning are intimately linked. Okay? Versioning is a game of trust and communication. I have a very small amount of information I can put in a version number. At least, you know, I could put version 2.1.0 dash, the one where I fixed the bug that does this, but it's still preview because, but I don't think anyone would use that. So if we're using normal version numbers, uh, we have a very limited amount of information, but we have to trust each other that we're not going to screw each other over. So that sort of goes back to the be kind as well. We are all in this collaboratively. If you try to play versioning in a competitive way, it's not going to work out well for anyone. So I want to think somewhat high level, at least for most of the talk. Out of interest, how many of you are .NET developers? OK, good, right. Um, that means I have to speak relatively quickly so that I can talk about the diamond dependency problem in .NET specifically. Uh, but we're not just going to talk about one kind of version. So we're going to think about why we have versions at all, how they're very, very contextual, a bit about compatibility and all the joy of that. Um, we will wonder after a while, you know, how many of you came this morning um, thinking, how has the world not collapsed yet? <laughs> OK, a, a few of you. Hopefully, as you leave, you'll all be going, how, how is it all working? Um, it's a little bit like when you look at a bicycle and think that's a very vertical thing, and you're saying, I need to just keep it vertical the whole time. That's never going to work. And somehow, this seems to have been the case for versioning in .NET. Um, and I'm going to hopefully put forward some ways of improving things. So starting with why we have versioning at all. I mentioned communication. And versions are pretty much always some form of communication representing almost a contract between different parties. Who those parties are can vary immensely, but they're, you're trying to give information about something else through this 
version. And the something else can be multiple different things. So we usually, if you start saying version, people often think libraries, because that's sort of the things that we consume and produce most that the versions change the most. But Mads and I were talking yesterday about C-sharp 8 and referring back to things that were introduced in C-sharp 7 and 7.1 and 7.2 and thinking about C-sharp 9. So clearly languages can be versioned and platforms can be versioned. I'll show you some of, some of the .NET related version numbers at the moment. Uh, books can be versioned, which is a very nice segue to say the fourth edition of C-sharp in depth is kind of hitting the printers really, really soon. Um, but I'm communicating something in, the, in that sense um, that if you've got the third edition, the fourth edition is going to be different because it's not got the same version number. If I said the fourth edition was coming out and you bought it and it was exactly the same as the third edition, you would feel treat, uh, cheated, you would have trusted me on something and I would have misled you. You see what I mean? That it is all about trust and trying to communicate something. These are all to do with change so broadly, if something doesn't need to ever change, it doesn't need to be versioned. You could give it version one and it will always be version one and that's kind of boring so just don't bother. So evolution is clearly going to be part of why we have versioning at all. Um, and in general, the, the aspects of how code can evolve and how all the aspects of code, the, the many things that go together by the time you've got something running, how those can all evolve in parallel um, is something that we don't think about enough in general and versioning is just one aspect of that. And all of this is important because the point of versioning within computing is generally so that we can have some kind of predictability, some kind of trust that if I smush together all of these 15 different things with 15 different versions, they will work. Because I know that a different set of versions of the same things worked, and people have told me, whether it's through semantic versioning or something else, that you know, given this set of versions works, this slightly different set of versions should work. So, I've talked about versions a lot. What do we know about versions? We've actually got a fair amount of common ground here um, that we, haven't, we don't tend to put into words. So versions are almost always textual. I can't remember seeing any version that wasn't some form of text. And usually in my experience, and this may well be different around the world, it's usually ASCII. Um, and it may or may not be human memorable. So, as an example of something that you could argue is actually binary rather than text, take a git um, hash. That is a version of the code base or the repository. It doesn't need to be code. Um, that's a way of identifying this is what was in the repository at that point. And we happen to see it as a hash that's all in hex, so it is textual and ASCII, uh, but you could argue that's actually a binary version. It's the, the hashes raw bytes. Versions may or may not be a form of identity. And in many cases, this is absolutely desirable. So libraries. If you download Node of Time, and I'll refer to Node of Time many times, um, it is not to, to get you all to start using it, because I'm sure you're all using it already. Um, but it's just a, a handy thing to have a concrete example. If you download Node of Time, 1.2.3, which is now years old, um, today, and then you download 1.2.3 tomorrow, you absolutely expect them to be exactly the same. If you talk to an API, as in a web API, some kind of web service, and it says, I am version one of this API, do you expect it to be exactly the same if you hit version one tomorrow? Can it return more data? Can it accept more fields? We'll talk a little bit about that later on. But the point is that the context matters and that identity isn't always as simple as it sounds. 
we've said that they're usually text, and in one particular case, they're often numbers, and a sequence of numbers. Uh, so semantic versioning in particular gives us a partial ordering, and it's only partial. Uh, so if I say which comes first, 1.1.0 or 1.2.0, it's pretty obvious which of those was released first. If I ask you which was released first out of 1.1.1 and 1.2.1, who knows? So it is only partial, um, and you shouldn't infer more than you can. If I give you a git commit, commit hash, if I give you two of those, which comes first? It doesn't provide enough context in itself. You need to go to another system. Git will be able to show you when each of them was committed, and maybe one is an ancestor of the other. Maybe they are uh, sort of siblings and don't have a common ancestor at all, or sorry, neither is a common ancestor of the other. So there are all these aspects of versions that we may have just taken for granted before. I haven't told you anything new yet, I suspect. Um, and I may well not do so for most of this talk. And that's fine. Um, I can still achieve my goal without you learning anything new. Because my goal is that you think about versioning more. OK? Uh, there are also uh, potential for aliases. Like, I'm not a, a Linux hardcore person, but I gather that Debian 9 is also called Stretch. And I know there are various other aliases in various other uh, flavors of Linux. And there can also be marketing names, like Visual Studio 2017 was Visual Studio 15. And Visual Studio 2019 is Visual Studio 16. And we're, as, as time is advancing faster than the version number, we're OK. When it was sort of Visual Studio 13 was in 2012, I think, or maybe that was VS 2013, they were a little bit close together and easy to confuse. But that's the difference between a marketing name and the, the version number that we would use for anything where we want to be kind of reliable. And then you've got uh, marketing names that end up being really confusing, like Java 6 versus Java 1.6. And goodness knows what's going on there. So I've said about some confusing version numbers. Here are some more. So this is uh, when I put together the slide this slide, and I'll probably never update it, because it doesn't really matter how current it is. But this was current at one particular time. So we had .NET, the desktop framework 4.7.2, and lots of numbers for .NET Core. So you download a, an SDK that was 2.2.200, that provided 2.2.1 as the runtime. And that runtime implements .NET Standard 2.0. And that SDK has the version of the, com the C Sharp compiler, Roslyn, or the Microsoft C Sharp compiler implementation, Roslyn, that supports C Sharp 7.3. And if you've installed Visual Studio 2017, and the current version of that was 15.9, then that will work well with all of this. So when I say that we need to know how versions work together as well as how they uh, evolve independently, this is the sort of thing I'm talking about. And here we've got several different versioning schemes within uh, just one slide talking about one family of products. Uh, the .NET Core SDK version number is particularly interesting because of the way that Microsoft has sort of decided uh, to have it's sort of four numbers rather than three. So there could be a 2.2.201, which you could sort of think of as 2.2.2.1. Um, and there's a, a document explaining why they're doing that and what everything means. And that's a really good thing. And it doesn't matter too much, to me at least, that it's not a very familiar versioning scheme. If you read the documentation, you will know what it means. You will be able to make predictions about what will be in a particular version compared with other versions. Another example of the same sort of thing the being deliberate about version numbers is this business about .NET Standard 2.0. I was in a conference call after several emails um, around 
what we should call the next version of .NET Standard. That's the version that will ship with .NET Core 3.0 and be supported by 3.0 um, and not be supported by .NET Core 2.0, 2.1, or 2.2. I haven't yet heard about .NET Core 2.3. It could happen. Who knows? So we considered .NET Standard 3.0, uh, .NET Standard 2019, .NET Standard A, .NET Standard 2.1, .NET Standard 2.5, and we looked at the pros and cons of each of these. And I was in this conference call for an hour and had previously responded on emails, but this was actually the culmination of a lot of work that uh, Kathleen Dollard and Imo and lots of people have been doing to try to work out all these pros and cons. And I offer this to you as a model of industry doing it right, possibly coming to a different conclusion than you would have come to, because it's kind of counterintuitive that .NET Core 2.1 doesn't support .NET Standard 2.1, when you know, it was true for .NET Core 2.0 supported .NET Standard 2.0. Um, but part of the reason for choosing 2.1 rather than 3.0 is to break that tie within developers' minds. And the sooner we do that, the better. If we have .NET Core 3.0 supports .NET Standard 3.0, then if you haven't already got the idea that those are tied together, you would probably get the idea. And then when things change later on, maybe in five years' time, .NET Core won't be the primary implementation of .NET Standard. You know, maybe, some com maybe a company that one of you will start will come up with a completely new implementation, and that will be absolutely fine. And this sort of goes back to all Scott's demos earlier on. So we don't want it to be tied to .NET Core, so we break people's mental model as early as we can. And all of this is a great example of people actually taking the time to think and taking the time to say, what am I communicating? Where am I, you know, if I've got to break trust with people because they've assumed things that maybe they shouldn't have assumed anyway, but do because we're human, what can we do? So in some ways, this is the key slide as the key example of what I want all of you to do, which is go away and anything that you are versioning, think about how you're versioning it and the impact. Let's go back to thinking about context. So I've mentioned some things that can be versioned already. Uh, books and all of the things on the previous slides. Applications, Office can be versioned. Operating systems can be versioned. Uh, languages, platforms, libraries, protocols at many levels. So, you know, we've got HTTP2 layered on top of, I have no idea. Does anyone happen to know whether TCP and TCP IP have versions beyond, you know, we know the address versions, we're mostly still on four, even though we should have moved to six. But are there separate versions of IP that evolve over time as well? I honestly don't know, but all of these certainly can be. You know, we know about POP3, IMAP4, et cetera, and things that are built on top of those protocols. So where you have APIs, so the, you know, the Google Cloud Storage API, currently on version one, as far as I'm aware, um, and at some point, maybe there'll be a, a version two built on top of other protocols with their own versions. And beyond things that are published, we work with versions every day within source control. You know, what is the current version? What, what's the last commit of a particular file or even a particular resource? You know, uh, this particular slide deck I did in PowerPoint, uh, the one this afternoon uh, Jennifer and I will be presenting, we've done in Google Slides, and it has a version history. So that's versioned as well. And when you're designing a versioning scheme, you must not assume that the versioning scheme you've used successfully for many things in the past applies to things in the future that are different. So for example, you know, Mads is here designing C Sharp 9. If Mads said, do you know what? Everyone in .NET uses semantic versioning. 
Therefore, if I'm building C Sharp 9, I can break everyone's code. It's fine. We don't make any pro promises about backward compatibility. We could steal classes by default. Yeah. It doesn't work. You've got to know the context because uh, that will change who's using these versions and what you're trying to communicate with them and the impact of breaking things. You also need to know how your dependencies, so I, I've mostly been talking about versions that we publish, but the reverse is true as well. I mentioned that there's a doc explaining the SDK versioning. There's a doc explaining net standard versioning. Um, I don't know whether there's a doc explaining C sharp versioning, but mostly it's all backward compatible, so it's kind of OK. But you need to understand what people are trying to tell you when they publish versions. And know that that won't always mean the same thing for exactly the same reason as you need to think of a new versioning scheme each time. You know, it can be an existing one, but you need to reconsider it each time you're doing something in a different context. Uh, every time you're consuming things from different contexts, you need to ask what people are telling you. So let's get into one particular versioning scheme that is probably amongst ourselves the most uh, well understood semantic versioning. And we'll think particularly in the context of libraries. Um, and probably for the remaining 38 minutes, we'll talk about libraries for a while and then network APIs for a while. And these are just two examples, that, but they're probably the ones that affect most of us the most. So semantic versioning, we have a major number, a minor number, and a patch number. And we can have something saying it's a pre-release. And it's interesting that there are multiple ways of showing a pre-release uh, because this is a GA version. If it were 0.2.3, that would be a pre-release. If it's 1.2.3 dash beta 1, that's a pre-release. Um, I'm not sure whether it's really a good idea to have 0. Point something mean something differently. Um, you know, what version should I use before the first release of 1? I'll use 0. Point something. What version number should I use before the release of 2? I'll use, oh, I can't use 1. Uh, I'll, I'll use 2.0.0 beta 1. And we have inconsistencies. But you know, it's backwardly compatible with what people have been doing in a somewhat ad hoc way for years and years and years. So to teach all of your grandmothers to suck eggs, so to speak, if you make a breaking change, you bump the major version number. If you make a non-breaking change that is backward compatible, you bump the minor version number. And if you make a change that is backward and forward compatible, you bump the patch number. Now, what do I mean by backward and forward compatible? I tend to think of what can I safely do if I'm consuming a library? If I am currently, if I have code that I believe is OK using 1.1.1, then I can safely move to 1.2.3, and everything should still work, because it's backward compatible. 1.2.3, you know, we'll say, is ordered later than 1.1.1, um, even if they didn't come out chronologically that way. And so that should be fine. The reverse is not true. I cannot go from 1.2.3 back to 1.1.1 and expect that my code will still build or execute if you're in a, um, an environment that doesn't have a separate build step, because maybe there's a new feature in 1.2 that wasn't in 1.1. My code uses it, so if I try to downgrade to 1.1, bang, that's fine. That's not the case for patches that should be backward and forward compatible. If I'm using 1.2.3, I should be able to go back to 1.2.2. Everything should still build if you're in a build kind of environment. And the only changes, you know, there must be some reason for having a new version number. There must be something changed, but it can only be implementation details. So there can be some kind of bug that I fixed uh, or that the library provider has fixed, rather. And I might see that change. So it's reasonable for my application to start failing because it turned out I was relying on something that was fixed in 1.2.3. But it should definitely still build. 
and nothing else should have changed. Now, there's a problem in everything I've just described. Does anyone want to venture a guess as to what I'm going on to next? Oh, either you're all shy or haven't thought about this quite enough, is I've talked about compatibility and not breaking people. Um, and I don't think we really understand what that means. We sort of think we do. Um, I've kind of explained it that if I have code that builds against 1.1.1, it should still build against 1.2.3. Or you know, let's just be simpler. 1.1 code builds should build in 1.2. Let's forget about the patch things. What does that mean I can do? Let's stick with C Sharp for the moment. Uh, what can I do between 1.1 and 1.2? If I'm creating no design 1.2, what can I do that's going to be compatible? Add a class. Add a class. Nope. Not if I'm going to be really strict about this. I assert that. Uh, I could, you know, playing devil's advocate as a, as a user, I could create um, an application that builds against 1.1, and then you add a class, and my code no, long, no longer builds. Because maybe I've got a class with the same name as the one that you've added. And I've got using directives to both namespaces, and suddenly things are ambiguous. OK, so that's a, a fairly big new way of doing features that's out. Uh, what else might I be able to do that's slightly smaller? Yeah. Uh, optional parameters. What about optional parameters? Well, just adding a new, a new option that's defaulted if you don't use it. Adding a new parameter. So to an existing method, I've got one method that's foo, and it takes int x. And you're saying I can change that from foo int x to foo int x, uh, int x int y equals 0. Uh, right, you've skipped on two slides, in fact, um, <laughs> because that so to some extent, that is source compatible. It's definitely not binary compatible. If someone has built code, so say I have built my application that relies on foo int x, and I've got that executable already built, and then I just plonk 1.2 DLL over the top and try to run it, it'll say, oh, no, I was expecting something. You know, Optional parameters are a compile time thing. Uh, I was expecting to find a method with one parameter. There is no such method anymore. Bang. OK, maybe you say, that's fine. I will make it just, uh, I'll only care about source compatibility, which you may well only compare about, uh, 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 care about source compatibility. And this is where context matters again. I'll come back to that in a sec when I finish this example. Um, but even source compatibility isn't enough there, because suppose I have a method accepting an action of int. Previously, I could have done a method group conversion of that method from the library and passed that as an argument to the, um, the method that accepts an action of int. I can't do that when I've got only a method with two parameters. So maybe you say, I'll do overloading instead. I'll keep my foo that takes an int and add a foo that takes an int x int y. And that sounds good. That gets around that particular problem. Uh, it then causes another problem. If you try to do a method group conversion and there are two methods, one accepts action int and one accepts action int int. And now you've got an ambiguous um, overload resolution problem. So I contend that almost anything, um, Mad suggested something yesterday uh, that may just about work, but I suspect I can break it because I usually can. Um, I contend that any public API change you make could break someone if they tried hard enough to be broken. Okay? And you know, if, if you were to give some cast iron guarantee, you know, I will pay you five million pounds if, uh, if you are broken by this upgrade well, then it's going to be quite easy for someone to claim that five million pounds. Um, adding a method, well, I had an extension method that was being called before, and now it's not. Um, and Mads is claiming that adding a property might be safe. Uh, so at some point, 
it's on my stack to try to, oh no, reflection, I, I think it's reasonable to uh, ignore reflection. If you are using reflection and peeking at my private fields, um, then, you know, if I were, if I were writing this, I, I claim that I won't break anyone, I would definitely put something in saying uh, reflection doesn't count. Um, because that really is what's intended to be an implementation detail. So many of you, I'm sure, use some. Sorry, is that a, another thing that might be a? What if you have a method with the same name as the property added, an extension method? Uh, if you have another method with the same name as the property that was added, um, that's exactly what I'll be trying. And uh, depending on the lookup rules, apparently there's cunning things to change that, uh, depending on whether you're trying to invoke things. But if the property is itself a delegate type that could be invoked, then uh, I, th I think it'll get weird. Um, as I keep saying, my life is full of corner cases. I'm sure I'll find one somewhere. Um, so that means if we were to be really strict about semantic versioning, we would only ever be at 1.0. <coughs> And 1.0.1 and 1.0.2, we can do patches, but we could never have another minor version. Does that sound like a, the world that you want to live in? No, because taking a new major version is a big deal. Um, you are saying, trust me, it might break. This is a scary thing. You probably don't want to do it unless you really, really have to. Expect some pain. So instead, we're in a situation where we know that something we have treated as black or white, as a, a Boolean toggle, you know, is this binary compatible, is this source compatible, um, really isn't. And that's the first thing that I think we should be trying to change as an industry, and it will be very definitely language sensitive. It could well be that in Java or in JavaScript or some other language that there are all kinds of non-breaking changes. And there could be a bunch of theoretically breaking changes that no one's actually going to worry about. But I think we should do better. If we start caring about versioning more, we will do better in terms of tooling and say, OK, I'm going to, I want to publish this as 1.1.0. Uh, is it actually compatible according to my rules that could then be you know, machine consumable in some way? Um, both at, at your producer side saying, I want to check it, and then anyone else can see, right, what standards are you holding yourself up to in terms of compatibility? That's one simple example where we were talking about a single library. Um, what happens if that library has dependencies? What happens if that library wants to take a new dependency? Hands up those who think, so uh, say no to time. Uh, no to time may indeed start to take a dependency on Microsoft.logging.extensions or abstractions or whatever it is, OK? Uh, hands up those of you who think that I can do that in a patch version. No one. Hands up those of you who think I can do it in a minor version. Just a couple, and major version. OK, most out of people who voted, major version was the biggest one. Right, I would probably go with major in that case. Would it make any difference if um, this was actually a brand new library that no one else could have had dependencies on? It's a gray area. Um, and we'll get into why that is in a bit. Suppose I have a dependency on Microsoft extensions logging um, version. I've no idea what version it's actually at, but suppose I've got a dependency on 1.2, and I want to upgrade that dependency to 1.2.1. Can I do that in a patch bump of node time? A minor bump of node time? And does that require a major bump of node time? OK, roughly equal, and people didn't want to commit. Um, which is absolutely fine. I would say patch in that case. I'm sort of propagating the, uh, the trust that I have in the Microsoft folks saying, oh, we haven't actually broken the public API here. So I'm saying, well, I haven't broken the public API. I expose transitively. 
What about if I take a new minor version of Microsoft Abstractions Logging? Is that a patch version? No, I'm seeing a few no's and a few hands. Is it a minor version? Y yes, and is it a major version? A, a couple. And of course, the answer is there's no single right answer here. I would tend to, aside from anything else, because it's really easy to remember, say, if you're taking a new major version, you bump your major version. If you're taking a new minor version, you bump your minor version. If you're taking a patch, you bump your patch. And taking a new dependency is effectively going from version 0 to version whatever it is that you accept. So that would typically be a major version. If you're taking a new dependency on a library that you are producing, ah, that's really tricky. Because you've got to work out, and this is a thought process that we go through in my team um, producing the .NET client libraries for Google uh, Cloud Platform Services, we go through a, a thought experiment of, right, if I do this in a particular way, who could it break? And you can imagine, again, just like with the, the C-sharp specific code examples, you can imagine I have this customer who adopts this set of versions, and then they update to my new version. Um, do they get broken or not? And if they get broken, then maybe I should bump it up by a major version. But it ends up getting silly. So suppose, um, suppose I have a new auth library within the Google APIs, and this is something that we're considering. And this is absolutely a concrete example, slightly simplified, but concrete example. So we have a GAX library, which is common, Google API extensions. Okay. Uh, we're at 2.5 of GAX. We would like to introduce a new auth library to get rid of our old auth library dependencies that end up depending on a bunch of stuff we don't want to depend on. So I will create a google.auth, for the sake of convenience, 1.0. In the new version of GAX, you know, by what I've said before, it should be GAX 3.0 that takes a dependency on Google Auth 1.0. But actually, who could possibly be broken by a new dependency on a library that didn't exist? Well, in theory, in several years' time, we might have a Google.Auth 2.0, and people could have been depending on a really old version of GAX, GAX 2.5, and Google.Auth 2.0. And so updating to GAX 2.6 that depends on Auth 1.0 could break them or break GAX, break their dependency on GAX because GAX 2.6 depends on something in 1.0 that's broken in 2.0. I don't think that's going to happen, though. I think anyone who takes a far distant future dependency on auth is living in the far distant future and wouldn't have a really old dependency on GAX. And I realize that having a slide with actual concrete examples might have made this easier to follow. Uh, but you're all very smart people. Um, so we've said that when we do that eventually, that's just going to be a minor bo boost. Because we've thought about it, and we have considered these cases, and we're acting in good faith, and we know that people are trusting us, um, and hopefully that they'll be able to get in touch if things go wrong. I mentioned uh, context earlier on, and how that affects you know, how you version thing X depends on, on, on what thing X is, and that a library is different to a language. There's more to context than that, because there's knowing how the thing is going to be used. So if you are writing a library, how many of you write libraries that are only used within your own company? Lots. Right. Um, now, at Google, we build from head, as in, if I commit a change to a library, everyone starts using that next time they build. And that means I can do something without, uh, we often don't have explicit versioning. It's just, well, pinned at this particular commit number, effectively, um, things were working. It means I can do something I would never dream of doing in node time between major, uh, you know, within a major version. I can remove a method. Shock because I can see all the code that could possibly call it. It's like it was all internal within one assembly in C-sharp. Um, and that's an awesome situation to be in. And it sounds like many of you are in that, at which point 
Maybe you don't care about the binary compatibility things because you know that people aren't going to ship a binary that was built against a different version of your library. Yeah, maybe. Because that then depends on dependencies. If everything that's, ship is, that's shipped is built at the same time, then you're in a good state. But this business about binary compatibility, the idea of code that was built against 1.1.0, will it work against 1.2.0, and that it doesn't work for the optional parameter version. I'm not picking on you. It's, it's just a really convenient example. Thank you for giving it. Um, that's really important because we can have multiple dependencies. And complex apps do have multiple dependencies. So suppose uh, your application depends on library X that depends on node time 1.1. And it depends on library Y that depends on node time 1.2. When that application is deployed, notice I'm 1.2 is going to be deployed with it. So library X that was built against 1.1 is going to end up having to work against 1.2. And that should be OK. If I've done my job properly as notice I'm maintainer, I'm looking for binary and source compatibility. So that should be fine. And then this happens. Um, hopefully, you can still read that nearer the back. It's the exact same example as I gave before, uh, just now, except instead of 1.1 and 1.2, we've got 1.2 and 3.2. And there is no reason to believe that this should work. OK? Um, with current build tools, as far as I'm aware, and please, if I'm spouting nonsense, tell me, well, feel free to say, say now, but as far as I'm aware, um, with current project formats and whatever in, in .NET, you will end up running everything against a single version of uh, libz, which is version 3.2. And you have to hope that libx still works. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. That's one way we can get into diamond dependencies. And here's a slightly different one, but with exactly the same result. Um, it's slightly simpler. I depend on a library that depends on something else, libz, and it depends on an early version. And my application directly depends on libz 3.2. Now, I've said there is no reason that this should work. How many of you are running any kind of .NET website? OK. Chances are you're all in this situation, or rather probably the previous situation. Because as soon as instead of libz, I say json.net, do you want to look at all your dependencies and what their transitive dependencies are and reckon that they're all using the same major version of json.net? I don't think so. Uh, so we're lucky that um, although I trust that James has been diligent and actually has only bumped the major version of json.net when he's needed to, I suspect that even the breaking changes aren't very breaking. Um, what version of JSON.NET are we at now? Is it 13, 12, 13? Something like that. Uh, imagine in version 15, say, uh, James Newton King thinks, oh, you know, we've got Newtonsoft.json. No one calls it Newtonsoft.json. Maybe I'll move everything into a namespace of JSON.NET. OK? I can do that in version 15. It's, it's a new major semantic version. Um, that really would cause everything to fail. Now, I know there are all kinds of interesting plans with .NET Core having its own lightweight JSON reader and, and things. Uh, but I would contend that the fact that things are still working is more through coincidence and um, probably pressure on James to keep things compatible than on good engineering. So I think we need to try to fix this. Um, I believe there are ways of doing it, but it will require language changes and probably NuGet changes and maybe core CLR changes, although I don't think so. Certainly, the desktop framework was quite capable of loading two different versions of the same assembly at the same time. Yay. It's just that there's no way of building a project file so that you'll end up deploying two different versions of the same assembly at the same time. 
Um, it's possible that if you had them both in the GAC uh, and you had strongly named dependencies with the full version number, you would end up getting multiple versions. But maybe you want to do this so that this situation works, that libx ends up using an entirely isolated copy of the version that it expected rather than the application using 3.2. Now, there are two situations for libx here. One is that it's using libz purely as an implementation detail. You know, maybe it's parsing its JSON configuration file and populating some objects, and that's fine. Or maybe it's something like nodetime.serialization.jsonnet, which is deliberately designed to work with json.net and uh, you can pass it a JSON settings or JSON serializer settings, and it will configure it to work nicely with the node of time types. You know, the, the public API is intertwined with the JSON.NET API. Those are different situations that we cannot tell apart at the moment. So I think when we express a dependency, we need to be able to say, I want this to effectively become part of my transient API, uh, transitive API, sorry. Very different. Or I want this to be a private implementation detail. And then in C Sharp 9, when we have the idea of references that are private or public, we can say, all oh, right, OK, compiler, you should give me an error if I have any method accepting or returning something that is from a private implementation detail. You know, that's, that's not allowed. And that would let us reason about things much better. And remember that. We're all about trust and communication and reasoning about what will work based on this very limited information. Even with what I'm proposing, which I do expect to write a blog post about at some point, uh, we don't necessarily end up with goodness. Because suppose libz has some kind of static cache that we expect to work, that we expect if we call please get me the ID for you know, some name. And it will generate an ID if it needs to and always return the same thing. Well, if we can load the two separate assemblies, that's fine, except we've now got two caches that maybe we're expecting to only get one. Oh, and the other language feature that we may need um, in C Sharp, as well as stopping us from doing things, is allowing us to do things. We've got external aliases already that say, oh, I want to refer to this assembly. We need some way of getting in the project system saying, I depend on both of these. These are both public dependencies, so they're part of, you know, maybe this is uh, nodetime.serialization.jsonnet, and this is uh, some other, maybe not date and time, but some geographic thing, and its integration with JSONnet. And they both expose JSON settings, and I need to be able to pass things around and from app 1.0, I need to be able to say, oh, I'm referring to the JSON.NET 1.2 or JSON.NET 3.2. So we need some better integration of what I'm talking about with relation to all my dependencies. So there are issues there, but I think if we start thinking about versioning, you may have caught a little theme there, um, then we can actually achieve an awful lot more. I'm going to close with uh, an example of how things can be very different from the library perspective. Um, and I was planning, when I prepared the slides originally, I was planning on saying, this is how Google does API versioning. Already at that point, it was a forward-looking statement. Um, I have a, we have an API improvement proposal thing internally um, where we can write up standards effectively, and then get them reviewed. And what I'm going to describe is what, what I have been proposing. And then, in fact, while I was away at another conference, um, a bunch of people thought, do you know what? We want to actually do it quite differently. So I don't know in two weeks' time whether this is going to work or something else will work, but it's, it's a valid proposal. I'm explicitly not saying that this is what you ought to be doing for API versioning, because you need to think about all kinds of people, many, many different people. The, the number of stakeholders for versioning of a network API is huge. 
you need to think about the people who are going to use it, your end users. And hopefully that will be the largest set of stakeholders and probably the, the ones most sensitive to pain. Then you've got the people building the APIs. You, know, you may, within your company, have 10 different APIs, and you're the poor chump who's responsible for designing this version strategy that all of the others are going to have to abide by. So you better make it easy for them to evolve their API as they go forward. You probably want to make it so that they can evolve it and test an idea with a certain set of uh, end users before they commit to it. Maybe you've got some infrastructure that needs to support this version, and uh, you've got people like me who build client libraries to make it easier for the end users, and they'll need to understand the versioning too. And certainly in our case in Google, you've got API reviewers who need to be able to see, oh, you were doing this in the previous version, you're doing this in the new version, that's not a backward compatible change. Just as I said that we need the idea of rules of well, this is compatible and this isn't compatible in a language, so it is with an API. Um, you may think, suppose you're just calling a JSON API uh, to return the weather, and you currently return it in Celsius. So uh, you return a JSON object with temperature colon you know, one. You may think it's fine to start saying, do you know what, I'm gonna start returning it in Fahrenheit as well, but in a completely backward compatible way, I will do another property called Fahrenheit, and that will be you know, whatever it is, 33, I don't know. And then some users start complaining because they're trying to consume this response on an Arduino, and your response is now bigger than it was before, and it's crashed the machine because it hasn't got enough memory. Like, you need to decide, does that mean you can never ever add any fields to your API? That's probably not what you want to say, but you want to do this deliberately. So you need to think of all your stakeholders. In Google, we describe our APIs in protocol buffers, which are basically schemas, effectively schemas, and then uh, descriptions of RPCs. And they look a bit like this. I know I had a bug last time I gave this talk, and I don't know whether I fixed it now. Um, but so we have a service that's got an RPC that takes a request and gets a key ring, and the request has a single field that's a name, and you, know, you, you get the idea. So what kind of versions will we come up with for this? Do we need the idea of a minor version? And this will depend on your API. Um, within Google, I'm just gonna skip some slides because we're running short on time. Within Google, this is our current proposal, that we have the idea of an experimental API version that can be broken at any time. So the API producer team might decide to just take the endpoint down, and please, I see people taking photos, only take photos as, hey, this is something I might consider. Don't assume this is actually what Google does or is going to do. Um, so experimental is unstable really unstable, it might exist, but you know, give you completely different responses tomorrow. We've got an alpha version, which is under debate. Should that be stable or unstable? If it has to be stable, then it's harder to change. Okay, because maybe we've got, uh, maybe in version one of, or version V1 alpha one, you have an RPC and you have a way of representing errors and you say, oh, I'll just return a string. And then you want a bit more information. So you would like to change the type of that field to be an error message. Um, it's unfortunate, the, the protobuf uh, declaration for a, a data type is called message. So when I say an error message, I mean message error that probably has a string field called message. Um, and detail and things. So can I change a field that was previously of type string to one called um, error? Definitely not in a compatible way. So if I'm doing this at an alpha level, maybe we'll say that doesn't necessarily need to be stable. When it comes to beta, they tend to be public and maybe we can't communicate with our stakeholders as much, our end users. Um, 
because we haven't done it as an opt-in thing. Anyone can just hit this API. It's harder to communicate. We don't have consent to email everyone, maybe. Uh, so we're more likely to make things stable. And then you really do need to do multiple versions of the API. And you probably need to keep these up for longer. So if you've got a service implementing, if you've got an endpoint implementing v1 beta 2 and v1 beta, sorry, v, v1 beta 1 and v1 beta 2, you probably need to keep both of those up in parallel for longer. But eventually, you get to v1. Woohoo! You ship. There's glorious victory. Um, parties all around. And then you want to add a new feature. And this is where I have been sticking to my guns, uh, possibly to my colleagues' uh, annoyance. Um, various colleagues want to be able to say, oh, we'll just go back to beta 2, v1 beta 2. And I'm saying, no, that sounds like it comes before v1. You know, Something beta 1 always comes before that something. You've shipped v1. You're doing a new thing to some extent. So we've got this idea of v1. You can read this as v1.1 alpha 1, v1.1 beta 1. But the key is there's no v1.1 ever. The only GA, general availability, version of the API is just the major version. Because accepting. You know, the, the, the version numbers here end up within namespaces and all kinds of things. And we want to be able to just upgrade things seamlessly, and people will get more or less information depending on what they happen to expect. So if you build against v1 uh, with an old version of the client library, you'll only see some fields that you get back. Maybe the fields will have come across the network, but you won't have the code to access them, but you can just update to a later client library version of the API version v1. I don't think I have a slide, but uh, we deliberately made the decision our client libraries have the API version number is part of the NuGet package name, so google.cloud.storage.v1, which means if we ever do have google.cloud.storage.v2, you can have both of those packages. You can depend on both of them and migrate some of your code and then the rest of your code. And it should be wonderful. But this business about new features get wrapped into v1 is entirely different. I would never do that in node time. I can't release 1.0.0 again, ever. So there's no sense of identity. This is one scheme. You may want a sense of identity. You might want to say, OK, well, I've got two ideas of version number, the sort of the, the major that describes the endpoint and everything generated uses that. But you could also specify maybe a date field or some way of saying the API at this point so that then your Arduino people can say, I would like your API to behave as it did at this point in time. And your server can then say, all oh, right, well, I wasn't populating Fahrenheit back then. I'll stop, you know, I'll remove it from my canonical response. But you've got to have infrastructure to do that. So you need to balance the, the extra work that the infrastructure team need to do. And how do you test? Do you test all of your requests against all of your possible versions every time you deploy? And by the time you've deployed 1,000 times and you have 100 tests, you're now running 100,000 tests every time. May not be feasible. That was probably uh, somewhat confusing, which was almost intentional. Because the whole point was not for you to learn Google's versioning scheme, but to learn that it's complicated. That there are lots of decisions to make with lots of different variables ab about you know, how much time does the infrastructure team have? Um, is it actually you're in a small company and you're just trying to get APIs out, so whatever's the most simple um, will work, because otherwise you will run out of money and just the company will collapse? It's all complicated. Um, we are really bad at several things in software. Uh, Jennifer was talking about accessibility earlier on. We're awful at error handling in general. Um, we're awful at anything that requires understanding other human beings, which is why diver well, one of the many reasons diversity is important. But versioning is one thing. I hope I've persuaded you today to spend a bit of time consciously thinking about and documenting why you make the decisions that you make about any versions that you produce. 
And finally, and it's sort of the same point, be kind to anyone who's using your code, whether that's colleagues, end users, whoever it is. Thank you very much. <laughs>